بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد um, First and foremost what is the name of this surah? We often refer to it as surah al-ikhlas What does ikhlas mean? We don't have any formalities here Somebody can just shout it out Yeah. Sincerity. Ikhlas means sincerity Okay, anything else? Excellence, Excellence? Who said that? Okay, interesting Anything else? Devotion, Devotion? Interesting Anything else? Okay. Uh, anybody here speak like colloquial Arabic? Uh, what they say, ammi, or just like dialect Arabic? Yeah, you got a few people. What does it mean in just everyday street Arabic when somebody says, when somebody says khalas? It means like finished, right? Something's done. Okay. Interesting. So think about that. That actually has basis in the classical Arabic language. Um, the root word, when we say something is khalis, when some, we say something is khalis, there's a couple of things that we mean by that. Number one, we mean that it is free from anything else. It's pure. So sometimes if you go and you want to buy honey, for example, or uh, some kind of jewelry, gold or something, they will tell you, this product is khalis. It's free from any other impurities or anything else added to it. It is 100% only raw, unfiltered, pure honey. Or uh, it is pure gold. It's not mixed with anything else. It is khalis. So that's one of the meanings of the word. That it is free from anything else. It is pure. Um, another uh, important implication of this word is the scholar said that the way that this definition applies to this surah is the believer who understands surah al-ikhlas internalizes it has love for the surah lives by it then they will be khalisun min shirk then that person will be free and pure from any disbelief or any situation of ascribing to Allah that which is not appropriate to ascribe to Him. Also, that will allow them to reach ikhlas, as the brother said, sincerity. When we talk about being sincere, it means doing acts of worship, acts of devotion, acts of goodness, seeking and hoping reward from Allah exclusively alone. If we want some other kind of reward from some other entities, then that's not complete ikhlas. That's like ikhlas plus something or minus something. But they said when a believer internalizes the surah, fully believes in it and loves it and understands its meanings, that will allow them to have ikhlas when they devote those actions of worship to Allah. Why? Because this surah only talks to us about Allah. That's all that we have in this chapter. The only thing that is discussed in this short chapter of the Qur'an is Allah. Who is Allah? And describing Allah. And that's actually very valuable because unfortunately, we don't talk about that as much anymore. Which is, which is problematic. Um, sometimes we like to engage in some very philosophical discussions or maybe some very political discussions or maybe what we think would be very relevant. There is a topic that is relevant always across any time and place and situation and that topic is talking about Allah. And when the believers get together, they should talk about God. They should talk about Allah. The Prophet ﷺ was gathered with the Sahaba and he told them, Hayya. He told them, Come here. Nujaddidu imanana. Let us renew our iman. Let's sit and talk about Allah for a little bit and strengthen and renew our conviction in Allah. And the reason or the, 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 the um, effect, the byproduct of us not discussing and learning and talking about Allah enough is we actually ended up filling that void with a lot of incorrect beliefs about Allah. So many times, a lot of false conclusions that we come to, 
a lot of uh, misconceptions, a lot of misunderstandings about our religion, it actually stems from an incorrect perception of who is Allah. So when you talk to a lot of people that have very strange misunderstandings about this religion, but when you dig into that a little bit and you search and ask questions and follow up on that conversation, you'll see that the perception people have of God, of their Creator, is a being that is malicious, evil, angry, all kinds of very negative perceptions that have crept into people's psyche, subconscious, sometimes not even we, we realizing it. And all of that happened because we didn't talk about Allah enough. We have to always be talking about Allah and never get tired of that. And always be reminding ourselves. And that's actually why this surah is so special. Uh, of the virtues of this surah, is that the Prophet ﷺ correlated between loving the surah and entering Jannah. How so? Well, there's this uh, um, famous story of a companion. Maybe some of you have heard this. But he was a, 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 an individual who the Prophet ﷺ assigned to be Imam of Salah. Amongst the Ansar, amongst a group of Ansar. Not everybody lived right next to the Masjid of Rasulullah. Not everybody was able to come and do all five times salah with the messenger in his masjid. Some people lived a little bit further out. Um, and it was difficult for them to come throughout the day. So they would come during Jumu'ah hour. They would come a couple of times in the week. So the Prophet would assign these groups of people an imam. Who knew the Qur'an and who could recite the Qur'an and who would lead them in salah. And so there was a group of the Ansar and the Prophet assigned one man to be their imam. But after a while, as is the case, so this isn't anything new. Even at the time of the Sahaba, people complained about their imams. Um, after a while, the people started complaining about this guy. Why? Because every single raka'ah of prayer, every single unit of salah, he would recite Surah Al-Ikhlas. Qul huwa Allahu Ahad. And so they got kind of annoyed by that. They were like, yo, cut it out. What is this? And uh, sometimes he would recite another surah of the Qur'an and surah al-ikhlas. So he told them, listen, what you see is what you get. If you don't like me, then find another imam. So they went to the Prophet ﷺ after some time and they complained to him. So Rasulullah inquired, well, let's hear both sides of the story. We're not going to make any judgment on anyone until we hear their case. And so when the man was asked, he said that this surah... <coughs> contains Sifatu Rabbi It describes to me my Lord And I love To read it because of that The Prophet Sallallahu said That Allah has granted you Jannah Because of your love for it Because of your love for this surah So having love for this surah Is a means of attaining a place in Jannah May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Gather us all in Jannah As He has gathered us here in the highest levels of Jannah. Another name for this surah is Surah At-Tawheed. As you know, the chapters in the Quran, by the way, um, some of them have multiple names. Not all the chapters of the Quran only have one name. So, this is one of the surahs that actually has multiple names. And that tells you the value and the importance of it. When something has a lot of names, that means it's special. So another one of the names is Surah At-Tawheed. Why? Well, the subject of Tawheed is a subject of studying who is Allah. Understanding who our Creator is. And because this Surah deals with that subject, it earned that name, Surah At-Tawheed. It also has another name as well. Surah At-Tajreed. Tajreed. I love seeing, mashallah, the folks that are taking notes. That's really, really impressive. Mashallah. Surah Tajreed. And Tajreed in Arabic means to remove uh, certain qualities from something. Jarrada, to remove certain aspects or qualities, negative ones. And this surah earned that name because we have Lam Yalid, Walam Yulad, Walam Yakullahu Kufuan Ahad. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this, here, in this surah negated certain qualities that people ascribed to God, to Allah. So Allah in this surah set the record straight. No, 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 no. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. That didn't happen. And we'll go into the details of each word inshaAllah. Wa lam yakun lahu kufun ahad. So it is tajreed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has removed these qualities from his description. Another one of the names is As-Samad. As-Samad. And as you guessed, that is because of the mention of this name in this surah, which is unique. And it's not one of the most common uh, uh, or often repeated names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll talk about what it means and what it implies. Another name that some of the scholars gave to this surah is Surah Al-Asas. And asas means a foundation, the first building block, that which a structure stands upon. <coughs> asas or shape, the foundation of something. Why? Because this surah lays down the foundation for this religion, the theology, the belief. You got to start with understanding who is Allah. That's your beginning point. We start with La ilaha illallah. We start with understanding who our Creator is who we are supposed to be devoting our worship to. Uh, we mentioned one virtue of this surah, that the Prophet ﷺ correlated it with having a place in Jannah. There are other virtues as well. You heard in the introduction <coughs> that it is often mentioned to be equivalent to a third of the Qur'an. Is that valid? The Prophet ﷺ said, "Ta'dilu thuluth al-Qur'an." It is equivalent to a third of the Qur'an. What does that mean? It's equivalent to a third of the Qur'an. Anyone have any ideas? Yes, sir. Good. So the brother is saying, "Well, this is a discussion of ajr, of reward, <laughs> of reward." So if you were to read this surah, you get the reward as if you were to read a third of the Qur'an. Okay? And so if a person were to read it three times... No, I'm serious. I mean, it's like basic arithmetic here, right? So then that would be equivalent to reading the entire Qur'an in reward. Yes or no? <coughs> yes, in a sense. So this is an opinion of some of the ulama that we're talking about reward. But they said, equivalency in reward does not take away from the greater reward of actually reading a third of the Qur'an. Let me say that again. Equivalency in reward does not take away from the greater reward of actually reading a third of the Qur'an. Let me give you an example. Anybody here been to uh, Umrah? Or Hajj. MashaAllah, quite a good number of folks. So those of you that went, I assume you guys went to Masjid Quba in Medina, right? Anybody been to Masjid Quba? By the way, like most amazing like Taraweeh spot for Ramadan. If you can go there in Ramadan, it'll be good. Um, so if you walked into Masjid Quba, they have like this plaque on the wall outside of the door and it says, uh, it's uh, written there as a hadith recorded in the book of a tirmidhi that whoever does tahara and goes to Masjid Quba and prays there, they will have the ajr of Umrah. So you were there on the Umrah trip, so you were like, score, no need to go to Mecca, we're good. The guys are like, I don't need to do that whole two towel business. No, nobody says that. Because there is a difference between the Prophet ﷺ likening the reward of two actions and something actually carrying the full weight of reward of the deed itself. I hope that makes sense. So, ta'dilu, some of the ulama said it is equivalent in terms of ajr. But that doesn't take away from the actual uh, uh, value of reading a third of the Qur'an itself. Wallahu alam. Any other understandings? Yes ma'am. Summarize up to a third of the 
Good, mashallah. Very, very well said. Jazakum Allah khairan. So the sister said, look, it's all about content. As I say, content is king, right? It's all about content. And now we have a lot of content creators. Um, content. What does she mean by that? Well, the ulama said, look, if you were to summarize the whole Qur'an into themes, if you wanted to simplify the themes in the Qur'an, you can kind of simplify it down to three themes. Aqaid, Ahkam, and Akhbar. Matters that deal with theology, matters that uh, dealing with rulings, law, legal aspect of the religion, and Akhbar, and information that Allah gives us. Whether it be of the past, of nations and communities before us, or of the future, or of the hereafter. But Allah is informing us of events and details and stories. So they said, if you, can, if you wanted to summarize the themes of the Qur'an, you can summarize it down to these uh, themes. And Surah Al-Ikhlas deals with what? It lays the foundation for the aqaid, for the theology and the beliefs. Henceforth, it is as if we are talking about one-third of the Qur'an from a thematic, from a content perspective. Because it is so abridged, it is so concise, yet so comprehensive in the implications of these verses. We have covered one-third of the thematic content of the Qur'an, the aqaid. And that's a very, very um, good understanding that many of the scholars uh, leaned towards with regards to what does it mean when we say Surah Al-Ikhlas is equivalent to a third of the Qur'an. Wallahu a'lam. Um, we often read this surah in salah. And uh, most of us, if not all of us, uh, do on a regular basis. And somebody once said, it is probably the most read surah from the Qur'an. Um, after Fatiha, I would say. But after Fatiha, I think that's very, very likely. But a man came to the Messenger وسلم, and he was speaking about another man who used to do Qiyamul Layl, he would pray in the night, like what all you guys did last night, mashallah. May Allah accept. But he came to the Messenger of Allah and he said, Yaqumul Layl, he stands in prayer at night with only the reading of Surah Al Ikhlas. That's it. And the hadith says, وَكَأَنَّمَا تَقَالَّهَا The narrator tells us, this man that was addressing the Prophet ﷺ, it's as if he was belittling from the value, like he only reads, that guy, he only reads Surah Al-Ikhlas and all Qiyam. Like, seriously? That's all you're going to do, man? So the Prophet ﷺ responded to him, and he told him, do you not know? That Surah Al-Ikhlas Ta'dilu Thuluth Al-Qur'an is equivalent to the third of the Qur'an. So the Prophet ﷺ kind of reprimanded him and taught him that don't belittle this Surah. Yes, it is short, but it is heavy when it comes to value and reward and meaning. Now having said that, maybe a lot of folks who are accustomed to only reading Surah Al-Ikhlas are like, score. I don't have to... Uh, I don't have to spend too much effort learning other portions of the Qur'an. No. That attitude will have the, the adverse effect. If I'm only reading Surah Al-Ikhlas because I'm too lazy to read anything else in the Qur'an, that's a problem. But reading it with pondering and with reflection and sincerely understanding and internalizing its value, that has huge blessing. May Allah make us people of the Qur'an. And by the way, if, if anybody is like settling for these short surahs because they think it's too difficult to memorize the Qur'an, please don't feel that way. You know, it's, it's really not that difficult. It's challenging, of course. I'm not going to sit here and tell you guys, oh, it's a walk in the park. No, it's challenging. And if you've tried that, you know that it's challenging. But it gets easier because memorization requires a certain part of your brain and it's like a muscle that you work out. The more you memorize, the easier memorizing gets. And there were people in Qur'an class that used to memorize 8, 9, 10, 12 pages in one day, in one sitting. And that wasn't hard. 
because it becomes very easy and the vocabulary of the Qur'an is repetitive. So a lot of words, you, you become familiar with them. So, so please, don't, um, please don't feel that it's too difficult. Uh, my teacher that I memorized Qur'an with, he had a student and she finished the Qur'an uh, shortly before me and she was 70 years old. And she started memorizing when she was 68. So uh, if she can do it, I'm sure you can too. <clears throat> this surah gives us, as we said, the foundation for theology. Theology is based on a phrase, a statement that we say. La ilaha illallah. Uh, we've heard this phrase before, I assume. We understand its implication, how important it is. Now the ulama tell us that this phrase is very interesting uh, from, a, from, a, uh, from a rhetoric perspective, from a language perspective because it consists of two aspects and they said theology affirming who Allah is always rests upon these two pillars there is no third and that is nafyun wa ithbat that is to affirm and to negate La ilaha is a negation. There is no one worthy of worship. That's a negation. You've just wiped the slate clean. Illa Allah. That's an affirmation. Except exclusively Allah alone. So this phrase of la ilaha illallah rests upon these pillars of affirmation and negation. And um, Surah Al-Ikhlas follows suit. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Allahu samad. لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد. The surah begins with affirmation. This is who Allah is. This is who Allah is. Allah is not this and not that. So we see the same pattern of affirming who Allah is and negating uh, qualities that are not appropriate to attribute to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Um, when was this surah revealed? So we know that the scholars of tafsir, they organized the Qur'an based on time of revelation. And so they have surahs that are Mecki and surahs that are Madani. And that which was revealed prior to the journey of Al-Hijrah, they labeled it as Meccan, Mecki surahs. And those that were revealed post journey of Hijrah, they considered Madani or Medinan surahs. Some of the ulama said that Surah Al-Ikhlas was revealed more than once on multiple occasions. This is one opinion of some of the scholars of tafsir. But the majority concluded that it is Mecki. Even if we say that it was revealed more than once, and some of those times being after the Hijrah, it still is Mecki because its first and primary revelation was in the Meccan phase prior to the Hijrah. What was the reason for revelation? What was the historical context? What was happening at the time uh, in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Well, we have this narration that tells us that Quraysh, you know, they were really agitated and annoyed and bothered by the message of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The majority of the uh, uh, people of Quraysh, of Mecca, were not happy with what the Messenger of Allah came with. Even though, just before he came to them with this revelation, they loved him. He was one of the most loved people in that community. Not just loved, but also trusted. Trusted and believed. And yet when he came with them with this message, that revolutionized the theology that they were upon, idolatry and pagan rituals, Ah, then they flipped a script. Then he went from being beloved to being someone blamed and insulted. And he went from someone being trusted to someone being called a magician and sorcerer. And from being someone who they trusted and believed to being someone they said was a liar and a false poet. So it's interesting how the script flipped when it didn't suit their desires um, so they decided, you know what, we're going to have a, a dialogue with, with this man, Muhammad. So Quraysh sent a man by the name of Amr ibn al-Tufayl. And he went to the Messenger of Allah. 
And he said to the Messenger of Allah, you know, what is it that you want? What are you really after here? What's your agenda? Are you looking to be wealthy? If so, we got you covered, man. We'll make you the wealthiest amongst us. Are you looking to get a lot of attention from women? You want to have a lot of women in your life? Don't worry, we got you covered. Or is it that you're sick? You're just mental. You're, you know, you got a, a mental instability. We'll bring someone to do some exorcism and cure you of your illness. What was the Prophet Sallallahu agenda? He had an agenda. It was none of those. His agenda was, as one of the Sahaba said, إِخْرَاجُ إِخْرَاجُ الْعِبَادِ مِنْ عِبَادَةِ الْعِبَادِ إِلَىٰ عِبَادَةِ رَبِّ الْعِبَادِ وَمِنْ ضِيقِ الدُّنْيَا إِلَىٰ سَاعَةِ الْآخِرَةِ to extract and remove and guide people from being subservient and in worship of other creation to servitude and worship of the creator of all creation. And to guide and to lead you from the limited and restricted nature of this dunya to the vast and unlimited nature of the akhirah. That was the agenda of the Prophet And what a great agenda. So the man said to the Prophet ﷺ after insulting and humiliating him with these lowly claims, as if that's all the Prophet was after, he told him, he said, Insib lana rabbuk. He said, give us the lineage of your Lord. Tell us the, your Lord's lineage. Describe your Lord to us. Where did he come from? As you uh, might have deduced, uh, the ancient Arabs, and not just the Arabs, but ancient Eastern cultures overall, they really put a lot of value into this aspect of lineage. Right? Every time we hear a name of a Sahabi or someone, we always hear Ibn so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, daughter of so-and-so, and, and sometimes their name goes on, like, you know, on and on and on. They, they took lineage very seriously. And actually, that's a positive thing. That's actually a good thing. You know, if I can take a tangent there for a minute, one of the objectives of the Sharia ah is to preserve lineage. It's very important for people to know where they came from. It's very important. Not, not as a source of bragging rights. Not as a means of, look at me, I am so and son of so and so from such and such tribe. No, 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 that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about understanding and knowing where a person's roots are from. The more a person is aware and acute of where they come from and what led to them being here on this earth right now, because a lot, a lot happened for you to be here right now. A lot of people had to come together, generation one after another after another. A lot of marriages had to happen. A lot of caretaking and, and work so it went into, you know, into play for you to be here right now, uh, breathing and, and, and kicking and, and living. And that's why lineage is important. Because all of those people carried pains and weight and sacrificed for us to be here right now. So we need to be grateful to all of those generations before us that were a cause of our existence today. So the idea of preserving and caring about lineage, it's important. So because they had this that was really deeply rooted in their culture, they thought they can apply the same terms to the Creator. And that's where they went wrong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no lineage. Because just like how we talked about why lineage is important for us, you see how we're indebted? You see how we were in need of our lineage? That's what led to us being able to be here today, communicating and sitting with each other. So if we were to associate that with Allah, that means that Allah was hasha, that was in need at some point or another. And a God who is in need of other entities ceases to be a God. Where is the perfection in that? Where is the completion? Where is the might if you have to be in need? And that's the distinctive difference between creation and creator. Allah was never, is never, and will never be in need of any other being or entity. And that's one of the implications of قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ
So they said, Sif, insib lana rabbak. Describe to us your Lord, give us the lineage of your Lord. So Jibreel came down revealing the surah to Muhammad. Qul, say, O Muhammad. That's why the surah starts with Qul. Say. And by the way, it is Qaf. A very, 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 very common mistake when we read it really fast and we don't pay attention is people say Qul. Do you guys hear the difference between those two? No? Versus is that, Did you guys hear that? I'm going to go with Sam Sharif on you guys right now. Right? Two different letters. One is from the back of the tongue, the other is from the uh, uh, further back in the tongue, closer to the throat. Um, so, mashallah, hafali sa'am, jazallah khairan. Put the love of Tajweed in so many people's hearts. Ku, uh, kul, means to eat. Like it's commanding someone to eat. So it's, it's inappropriate to make that mistake here uh, with that word. So just wanted to mention that so we be careful. Step one to fixing a pronunciation mistake is to be able to hear it. If you can't hear your mistake, you won't be able to fix it. So just spend time listening. Before you recite, listen. Do a lot of listening. Uh, and sit with a teacher, inshallah ta'ala, if that's something that you need help with. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say, who is this command directed to? It's directed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in response to this claim and question that the people came to him with. And it is also, by extension, a command to all of us. Say. Say what? Allahu ahad. Proclaim and announce who your creator is. Don't be ashamed about carrying that belief. Don't hide that or hold that back. Proclaim it. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. That was a command to Muhammad sallallahu and by extension to his ummah. This ummah has to say, who is Allah? Is that for me? Zakallah khairan. This is fuel right here. رَفَعَ اللَّهُ قَدْرَكَ يَا صَائِمٌ قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ Say, He is Allah. Ahad. Allah. So right, off the, right from the top, we have this name of Allah. And we might have heard before that Allah has many names. How many names does Allah have? Yes, sir, in the back. Only Allah knows. Only Allah knows. Allahu Akbar. Yes. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna lillahi tis'atan wa tis'een asma. That to Allah is 99 names. But the ulama said that does not mean those are the only names of Allah. But these are the ones that Allah informed us of and that we know about. So, how many names does Allah have? An infinite number of names. Because Allah is the creator of these asma' to begin with. وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءِ Allah is the one who created Adam and taught him the names and the words of all things. So this is what has reached us. And these are names of perfection and beauty. Asma' al-Husna, beautiful names. Um, this is the most repeated name of Allah. And it is Allah. Now, I don't want to get into too many details about what this name means because the ulama have many opinions about what it means. Many, many opinions. We'll just mention a couple. A dominant opinion that many scholars uh, um, affirmed is that it means the supreme entity who deserves to be worshipped. But there's one other meaning that is less popular, but I want to mention it because every time I reflect on it, it amazes me. Some of the scholars, they said, Allah, it comes from the root word in Arabic, waliha, uh, uh, to be in a state of loss. To be in a state of loss. And actually, the ancient Arabs used to use this word to describe a mother, a woman, who lost her child in infancy. The child died. 
they would say muwalla why if uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve all of you and preserve all of your children for those of you that are parents and if you are parents to be inshallah may Allah grant you children that are healthy and you see you see them come and reach fruition and maturity but if you have ever heard of or spoken to a parent specifically a mother who has lost their child especially in infancy or a miscarriage uh, it is an extremely overwhelming and depressing experience and, and rightfully so as a matter of fact many many uh, mothers who suffer the experience of a miscarriage actually fall into major depression and it's important that if anybody experiences that that they get the necessary help and therapy that they need the grief therapy so that they can be able to continue living a fulfilling life and process that experience how is this related to Allah they said because the one who does not know Allah will have that void and that emptiness and nothing can fill that emptiness just like if you go to that mother who lost her child in infancy nothing will fill that void that she feels except having that child that child has passed so likewise the implication of this linguistic meaning to the name Allah the one who does not know Allah will have a void and an emptiness that nothing can fill except knowing and being connected to Allah Allah not only is he the one supremely deserving of our worship but he is the one that we need to know and be connected to and if not then there will be an emptiness in our hearts and in our lives May Allah make us of those who know Allah and who are close to Him. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ Okay. How do you say one in Arabic? واحد So how come we don't have here قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ وَاحِدٌ We have here قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ Yes. Interesting. Mashallah. Yes. Say that again. Wahid implies that. Hmm. I think I see where you're going with that. Okay. So basically, both answers kind of are similar in the sense that they're implying Wahid leaves room for others. But Ahad is more uh, eloquent in expressing oneness. And that is true. Um, that is correct. Ahad. The scholars, they said, Ahadun fi dhatihi, wahidun fi sifati. The scholars, they said, he is Ahad in his essence. In the being of Allah, in and of Himself. And the essence of who Allah is, is something almost impossible for the, not almost, is impossible for the human imagination to uh, fathom and capture. But they said, Wahidun fi fi sifat. Wahid when it comes to the attributes. Because there are many attributes. Each attribute applies to the same entity to the same Allah they said because an attribute you can have multiple attributes that refer to the same entity some philosophers I don't want to get too complicated on you guys I think it's still early you can start philosophizing after 10 a.m. not before some philosophers they said if there are multiple attributes to something that that means that what is being described also has uh, multiple beings and this is actually incorrect philosophically it's it's something that is uh, debunked and also mathematically as well you can have multiple descriptions referring to the same entity 
And so they said, Ahadun fi thatih. And Ahad, as the brothers were alluding to, is more comprehensive and more eloquent and more rare in usage in the Arabic language to refer to the singular. So it's a much stronger way in Arabic of expressing oneness. Yes, you could say wahid, as we say in the number, like when we count. But when you say ahad, it is more eloquent and a stronger way of affirming that oneness. In the being, fi thatihi, in the being and essence of who Allah is. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Also, when it comes to the attributes, they said, Wahidun fi sifat. They said Allah is one in His attributes, but they used Wahid, not Ahad. Why? Because they said someone else could have the same attributes as Allah, but they don't manifest in the same way. How so? Well, you're all alive, right? Everyone here alive? Oh man, I heard like five people, that's a problem. <laughs> is this Johar Jashanda? Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Man. Bismillah. Allahumma shfi anta shafi. My dad truly honestly believes that Jashanda will cure any sickness. Of course Allah is the cure, but you know what I mean, right? You guys are going to get all complicated here. So you guys are alive, huh? Yeah. Okay, good. Of the attributes of Allah is Hayat, life. Allah is Al Hay. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa Al Hay al Qayyum. Is Allah's life like your life? Yes or no? No. Why? Well, because your life didn't exist at one point. So first you were not alive, and then you became alive. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not have a starting or beginning point. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not bound by the uh, limitations of time the way we are. There was no beginning, no end. So there was no starting point. Uh, your life is eventually going to come to an end. Anybody has trouble grappling with that or believing it? Sorry. It's just a reality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never expire, never come to an end. His life will never cease to exist. So Allah has the attribute of hayat. You all here have the attribute of hayat. Same attribute, totally different in the way that they manifest. They are completely different. And that's why the ulama said وَاحِدٌ فِي الصِّفَاتِ because other creations of Allah can have the same attributes, but they are not the same in the way that they exist. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He gave us a principle in the Quran, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ Absolutely nothing is similar to Allah. There isn't anything that you know of and that which you don't know of that is similar to Allah. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ but he is the all hearing and all seeing. And the ulama said Allah concluded the verse with these two attributes, which are attributes that his creation has as well. Human beings and other creatures of Allah, they see and they hear. But their seeing and their hearing is completely different and is not similar or comparable to the vision and the hearing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One is dramatically limited and the other is completely unlimited, not bound by any limitations of time or space or any other dimension. Ahadun fi dhatihi, wahidun fi sifati. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Can we pause here for a moment and ask the question and think, what is the importance of oneness? What is the importance of oneness? Why is this such a... a, a whenever people introduce Islam to those that don't know about it, they always begin with this idea. 
The fundamental idea of Islam is to affirm that Allah is one and He alone is deserving of our worship. We hear that a lot, right? That's correct, that's good. Why is it so important? Somebody might come and say, what's the big deal? Yes? Good. Uh, and so this is something that Allah tells us in the Quran. Allah says, لَوْ كَانَ فِيهِمَا آلِهَةٌ إِلَّا اللَّهُ لَفَسَدَتَا Allah said, if in this universe, in the heavens and the earth, was any other ilah other than Allah, the two would have destroyed, collided and been destroyed. Why? Because that's the nature of, that's, that's the, the natural progression, the natural process, when you have two uh, you know, strong entities or powers. There will be some competition between the two. And so if there was another deity other than Allah, there would have been conflict. And that would have led to destruction. So in essence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid the success and the continuity of this universe upon the fact that He is the only and supreme creator. This universe is able to continue and exist because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one single supreme creator. With no one else meddling uh, you know, into the affairs of this universe and causing that level of corruption, destruction. Although we, as creation of Allah, we cause corruption, destruction on a micro level and when you add up all of that it becomes a macro level. But it does not interfere with the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of that is part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan. Even in the human being, there is an aspect of oneness. How so? Allah said in Surah Al-Ahzab, مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلٍ مِّن قَلْبَيْنِ فِي جَوْفِهِ Allah said, we did not make any human being, we did not make mankind, this man, with two hearts, in their chest. Imagine if somebody had two hearts, and we don't only mean here physical hearts beating, because somebody might come and say, well, there was a, you know, somebody was born with some kind of medical deformity or something like that. That's not what we're talking about. But we're talking about qalb here, meaning the central uh, um, processing unit of feelings and emotions and decisions and choices that a human being makes. And if a human being had two of those hearts, two of those places where emotions are, they would never be able to move forward or move back. Or go up or go down, or left or right. It would constantly be confusion. Hayra. I mean, even with one heart, even with one collection of emotions, and we so easily get confused. Imagine if there were two sets of, you know, a pair. We'd never get anything done. So this idea of oneness is very important. How is it really relevant to us today? I was thinking about this. And um, if you think about it, it's very important to have a singular source for moral and ethical code of conduct. There needs to be one singular source that defines ultimately what is good and what is evil. And if there isn't, the implication of that is the boundaries and parameters and definition of what is good and what is bad will constantly be changing. That's a very theoretical way of explaining it. But that's exactly what we are witnessing in our day and age. Something that was abominable 20 years ago is praiseworthy today. And something that is praiseworthy today could very well in 10 or 15 or 20 or however number of years become one of the most heinous of crimes. Unless a human being aligns himself with one singular source of code. Code of conduct. Ethical and moral code. 
Otherwise, they will constantly be flip-flopping. They will constantly be wishy-washy. And that's why those that refuse and reject to accept Allah as that source, as that deciding entity that decides what is ultimately good and what is ultimately evil, they will constantly have fluctuations and changes. And I'm not just talking about interactions or dealings. I'm talking about ethics and morals. The very core of what is good and what is evil. And when that is constantly changing, that's what destroys society. That's what leads to a very unhealthy society and community. So this idea of oneness is actually extremely liberating. It's extremely liberating. And I can't tell you how many times I have heard from people that accepted Islam. People that came from a background where they weren't practicing Islam and then they embraced this faith. I can't count to you the number of times I hear them speak about how liberating it was to affirm one singular creator that they would devote their heart and their worship and their servitude and their obedience to. Because it frees you from being tied to any other entity that will tell you who to worship and how. So the, the, sim- the, the, the simplicity of it is actually extremely profound. And it's something that we can contemplate and think about for a very long time. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ It's extremely profound. And when the believer internalizes this concept and it is deeply rooted within their heart, the attachment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala singularly, Himself alone, exclusively, then they will be able to be sincere. Then they will find ikhlas. And that's something we have to continuously grapple in our hearts with. Ahad. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدْ Let's move on. I think we are over our time. Allahu الصَّمَدْ Again, Allah repeats His name, Allah. Because of its importance and because of its value. As-Samad. What does As-Samad mean? Man, we could talk about As-Samad all day. The ulama of tafsir have so many understandings of what As-Samad is. Actually, it reached almost 16 different linguistic opinions of the meaning of this one word. And somebody might hear that and, and be bothered by it. But actually, that's amazing. Why? Well, number one, it tells you how amazing the language of Arabic is as a language. We're not talking about a culture or a superiority of a people. We're talking about the strength and the linguistic value of the language. And that's why Allah chose it to be the vessel and the medium of the Qur'an. But also, it is very impressive at the scholastic breadth and achievement of the scholars of this ummah. That they didn't take any single word in the Qur'an lightly. And they dissected every single word. Now let's talk about this for a second. The differences, the different opinions and different interpretations in the Qur'an are of two types. One is called ikhtilafu tanawwar. Ikhtilafu, ikhtilafu tanawwar. And the other is called ikhtilaf at-tadad. The first one is ikhtilaf at a difference of opinion that is um, all of the different opinions can coexist simultaneously. They do not contradict each other. The second type is ikhtilaf at tadad where you have multiple opinions and you cannot affirm both or all of them simultaneously. One or the other needs to be the one that is affirmed. And the vast majority of differences, difference, differences of opinion in the Quran are of the first type and not the second. And so we say here, when we say here that al-Samad, the ulama said 16 or more different opinions for what it means, this is ikhtilaf al-tanawwar. 
So what are some of these opinions? Some of the ulama said al samad and, and the majority of the early, early generations affirmed this definition. They said, and this is going to be a little bit tricky, so bear with me here. They said, al samad al la jawfa lah. They said, al samad is the one that has no empty cavity inside it. Anybody confused by that? Okay, let's try it one more time. A jawf is an empty, a hollow space in the middle of something. So the human being has a jawf. You have your, your chest. And the space, there is an empty cavity inside and there's organs in there that are filling that space. And then you need actually some room so the lungs and the diaphragm can expand and contract and all that good stuff. There are pockets of empty space. That's called jawf. Something that has an aspect of hollowness. There's an emptiness inside of it. So they said, as-samad, the linguistic meaning of samad is a being that has no jawf. There is no empty space inside of it. That's something to think about for a couple of minutes. Allahu as-samad. How does that apply to Allah? We don't affirm any images or any shapes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is far above that. Let's keep listening to the other definitions. As we said, they are complementary. And the puzzle pieces will start to come together. By the way, on a linguistic tangent, if anybody here studied morphology, sarf, anybody took a sarf class? Morphology, Arabic morphology? Okay, one guy. So, and one girl. So, um... If you remember, there's a word that is ajwaf. A word that is ajwaf is one that has a vowel letter in the middle. Like for example, the word qala, qaf, alif, lam. That alif is a vowel. If a word has a vowel in the middle, it's known as a ajwaf, a word that has some hollowness. Because a vowel, unlike a consonant, is a, uh, it comes from the jawf. It comes from the hollow part. Man, I'm getting real with Sam Sharif on you guys right now. It's like, whew. The word sa, mid, saad, meem, dal has no vowel. So from a linguistic, from a morphology perspective, even the word itself, the construct of the letters, is not ajwaf. There's no vowel. That's pretty amazing. Tayyib, let's keep listening to the other definitions. They said, as samad is the one that everyone turns to for their needs. Yasmadu ilayhi al All creation turns to Allah for their needs. What else? They said, as samad is the one who has reached perfection and completion in each of their individual attributes. Al-Sayyid, Al-Kamil fi Su'dadeh. Al-Jawad, Al-Kamil fi Jawadeh. The most generous, not just gen- but the one who has reached completion and perfection in their generosity, completion and perfection in their authority, completion and perfection in their might. What else? They said, al samad is the one who never eats or drinks. Never eats, never drinks. Some said a samad is defined by the next verse. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. They said lam yalid wa lam yulad is the definition of a samad. No children, no parents, no offspring. Didn't was not born from anyone, it did not give birth to anyone. And some said, and this one is very interesting, and this one I think summarizes all of the definitions and meanings and brings them full circle. They said, al-samad, this goes back to the word in the Arabic that means qasd, that which is sought. Yaqsidu ilayhi nas. I'm in trouble. Thank you. Okay. يَقْصِدُ إِلَيْهِ That other creations seek and go towards Allah. Allahu samad We need to seek Allah. We have to go to Allah. 
Allah said in the Quran, فَفِرُّوا إِلَى Allah, Race, rush, hasten to Allah. Go, move to Allah. Don't be stagnant. What does that mean? Don't be stagnant in your obedience. When Musa السلام, had an appointment with Allah, he said, وَعَجِلْتُ إِلَيْكَ رَبِّي لِتَرْضَى I hastened to my appointment with you, Allah, so you would be pleased with me. When it comes to fulfilling what is pleasing to Allah, he can't just sit back and relax and just say, hey, eventually. Seek Allah. Allahu as-samad. One way or another, every single creation will seek Allah. In Surah Maryam, Allah said, "In kullu man fi samawati wal ardi illa aati rahmani abda." Every single creation of Allah eventually will be a abd, will be in need of Allah. Even the ones that don't want to admit it and affirm it, even the ones who say there is no Allah, can you stop yourself from pooping? No. You can't even stop yourself from defecating and you can't affirm that you are in need of Allah. How great is a creation that can't even prevent themselves from defecating and urinating? How great is a creation that can't even stop themselves from falling asleep? How long can you stay awake? Take all the caffeine that you want. Eventually you're going to crash. لا تأخذ روسينة ولا نوم. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never afflicted by any fatigue or any sleep. One way or another, every creation of Allah will turn to Allah in need, whether they admit it or not. Allahu as-samad. So we would be doing ourselves a justice to seek and turn to Allah. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. And this negates the claims the many claims that were made that Allah had children or that Allah was a child of someone else. And these are the biggest lies that the history of humanity has ever witnessed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Maryam said, تَكَادُ السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ يَتَثَطَّرْنَ مِنْهُ وَتَنْشَقُ الْأَرْضُ وَتَخِرُّ الْجِبَالُ هَدَّا The skies are going to crack open and the mountains will crumble down from what? From this claim. And Rahmani Walada. From this claim that Allah has offspring, has a child. The human beings just utter this statement as if there is no bearing to it. But if the if the mountains if we could witness the impact of such a phrase on the skies and on the mountains, they would crumble and they would be destroyed. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ And there is absolutely no one that is equivalent, equal, on equal standing, similar to Allah in any way. And in this final verse is actually a beautiful linguistic point here. Usually in the Arabic language, if you wanted to make this statement, you would say, وَلَمْ يَكُنْ أَحَدٌ كُفُوًا لَهُ You would mention the object first. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ أَحَدٌ كُفُوًا لَهُ There isn't anyone that is kufuan for Allah. But the order was reversed. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَد There is no one equivalent, there is no one كُفُوًا, there is no one similar on equal standing, anyone. Why is that? In the Qur'an, oftentimes when Allah is addressing Himself, there is a certain pattern that is used. And that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions himself before the object of the verb or the object of the noun. But he mentions the laftul jalala first. Like for example, in Surah Al-Fatiha, 
إياك نعبده You alone we worship Usually the way that that phrase would happen in the language would be نعبده ك We worship you but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned Iyaka, mentioned his name first, or the pronoun referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. Why? In Arabic, this is something we call hasar, exclusivity. It removes any, any potential for this to ever occur, and then Allah mentions the name to give that exclusivity that exclusivity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this standing in this position that nobody else has that status and that rank alongside or besides or with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ahadun ahad these are some of the meanings and some of the implications of this short surah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who internalize it and understand it.